Christ. Amen. I want to begin this morning by pointing out three indispensable things in Hebrews. Three indispensable things. Chapter 9 and verse 22. In all three texts you will find the word without. 9.22 And almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission. The indispensability of the blood of Christ. Chapter 11 and verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him, to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The indispensability of faith. In chapter 12 and verse 14. Chapter 12 and verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. I take this to be positional sanctification. We'll not quibble about that now. But the indispensability, the indispensability of holiness, of sanctification, three indispensable things. And this morning we want to consider the perfect sacrifice of the perfect Son. Your Bible is open to Hebrews, the end of the book. Turn to chapter 10, please. Chapter 10. What we're going to look at this morning was performed in a body. Hebrews 10, verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not but a body hast thou prepared me. The great sacrifice was performed in a body. Verse 7. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. The great sacrifice was performed in a body and prophesied in the book, not a book, the book. Read Luke chapter 4. When our Lord entered into the synagogue, they handed him the book. And when he opened the book, he read from the book, and then he handed back the book and closed the book. There is only one book. And the best book to interpret the book is the book. The Bible is a self interpretive book. And then chapter 9 and verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? He was performed in a body, prophesied in the book, and purchased with his blood. Chapter 10 and verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Performed in a body, prophesied in the book, purchased with his blood, and will be perfected in the believer. Ephesians 2 7. The day is coming. When God will show off his church and Christ will present his bride, the perfect bride of Christ, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Sacrifices and offerings are used synonymously throughout the scriptures. This is common in the human race to offer something to a deity, been found in the religions of all people, even pagans, have some kind of a sacrifice or an offering. The ancient Hebrews had many and varied sacrifices. In order to understand Hebrews, we have to go back 
to the book of Leviticus. Now, if you turn back to Leviticus, you'll find a number of sacrifices. For example, in chapter 1, there's the burnt offering. In chapter 2, there is the meal offering. Chapter 3, the peace offering. Chapter 4, the sin offering. Chapter 5, the trespass offering. If you go through the reading of Leviticus and note the sacrifices and offerings, you will discover that blood had to be shed before any sacrifice could be offered. A poor person could bring a turtle dove, a lamb, a goat, or a heifer. They brought what they could afford, but it had to be slain, and the blood had to be applied. But all of the sacrifices and offerings in the nation of Israel could never take away sin. And these Jewish converts, these Hebrew Christians, needed to know that the sacrifices of the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, could never take away sin. For a few moments this morning, we want to look at the perfect sacrifice. Now, if you will notice chapter 10, verse 11, verse 11, every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which could never take away sin. They were offered day by day. Never a day went by but what they didn't bring their offerings and the priests had to offer them. Chapter 9, verse 7 and verse 25. They were offered year by year. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, sacrifices were offered that could never take away sin. If you read through chapters 9 and 10, underline every appearance of the word often. They were offered often. Now I want you to look at the perfect sacrifice. Chapter 9 and verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Mark in your Bible the word once. Verse 26. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but not once in the end of the world or the age hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, blood, 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 which could never take away sins. And now the writer to the Hebrew says, look, brothers and sisters in Christ, this is God's perfect son who offers himself as the perfect sacrifice once only once he needed to offer himself. Verse 28 of chapter 9. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Chapter 10 and verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, once for all time and once for all people, whether Jew or Gentile, God is no respecter of persons. Once, verse 12 of chapter 10, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, there never needed to be another one sat down on the right hand of God. Brother Tom Taylor brought that out so clearly from Colossians chapter 3. Where is he now? Seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He needed to die only once. Chapter 10, verses 10, 12, and then verse 14. For by one offering he had perfected forever them 
that are sanctified. So we see the perfect sacrifice in the person of our Lord Jesus. Let me just present a series of contrasts between Old Testament sacrifices, and the Jews looked forward to that, and the one sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. The animals that were brought for sacrifice were passive victims. Sometimes they had to be bound in order to be slain. But the Lord Jesus Christ came to die. Matthew 20, 28. The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life. Give his life. A ransom for many. We hold to the virgin birth of Christ, the virtuous life of Christ, the vicarious sufferings of Christ, and the voluntary death of Christ. He came to give himself. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. I like Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me a voluntary sacrifice, not a passive victim. You will notice throughout the Old Testament that all of the offerings, the sacrifices, had to be without blemish. Now the priests did the checking of these sacrifices. I am sure that they were sincere and earnest, but not always capable of detecting a flaw that might be in the body of any one of those animal sacrifices. Begin with verse 5 of Exodus 12 and through the book of Leviticus 19 times. And you'll find the phrase, without blemish. It had to be a sacrifice without blemish. Again I say, viewed by human priests, and they could be wrong. I'm sure not every animal sacrifice was totally without blemish. But when the perfect sacrifice presented himself, he was without blemish. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14. Chapter 9 and verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, without spot to God, we are redeemed not with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ that is a lamb without spot, without blemish before God. God saw his son. In the breaking of the bread, one of the younger brethren made some comments on the sinlessness of, Christ, sinlessness of Christ. He knew no sin. He did no sin. He was without sin before God, God's holy lamb. Behold, the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Then there was something else about the sacrifice. The sacrifice of the Lord Jesus did something that Old Testament sacrifices could never do. Deal with the conscience. What is conscience? It's that faculty within each one of us which decides as to the moral quality of our thoughts and our deeds. It's made up of two words, really. The prefix con, meaning with, and science, meaning knowledge. Knowledge with. God has given to each one of us a conscience whereby we know right from wrong. We knew when we do wrong. And the Old Testament sacrifices could never deal with conscience. Hebrews chapter 9, and this time look at verse 9. Hebrews 9, 9. 9, 8 says, The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure or a type for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Old Testament sacrifices could never deal with the conscience. 
Now look at chapter 10. Chapter 10, reading from verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshippers once heard should have had no more conscience of sins. There's a wonderful thing that the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ purges our conscience. We no longer are troubled about the sin. We're sorry for our sins. But what a wonderful thing Christ has done for us, not only in paying the penalty for our sins, but giving to us a conscience that is now unburdened because Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Do you ever recall your past sins? I'm sure we all have this experience. Yet, it's a great blessing and a joy to put your head on your pillow at night and know that the sacrifice of God's perfect Son has not only delivered us from the guilt and penalty of our sins and made provision that we can have victory over the practice of sins, but also deals with the conscience as well. No more trouble in the conscience. The perfect sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the perfect Son offered the perfect sacrifice to provide a perfect salvation. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Beginning with um, verse 1. Therefore, now go back and see what was said about the Lord Jesus. In the last verse of chapter 1, we're told that the angels are ministering spirits Send forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Now, the writer is writing to Christian people. What could be involved in being heirs of salvation? There is an inheritance. Not all believers will receive the same degree of reward in heaven. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip or drift. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, he's not dealing with salvation, he's dealing with reward. How shall we escape? Escape what? The reward this inheritance, if we neglect so great salvation. Not if we reject it, we already have it. But we can neglect it. And there is a reward to be given to or withheld from every believer if we neglect this great salvation. Turn for a moment to Second Corinthians chapter 5. I think our rewards uh, extend into the literal kingdom on earth, the millennial reign of Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 5 is a text that appears two times in the New Testament. Romans chapter 5 verse 10 and Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10. Look at verse 10 of Second Corinthians 5. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Please note, this is written to believers. Begin with verse 1 and read on down to verse 10. Everything that's mentioned in those first 10 verses must apply only to Christians. None of it could apply to an unbeliever. So when we come to verse 10, we must, it is inescapable. We will be there. We must. We must all appear. It is not only inescapable, it is inclusive. 
we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That every one, it is not only inescapable, not only inclusive, it is individual. Every one may receive the things done in his body according to what he hath done, whether it be good or bad. It is impartial. God keeps records. He's writing to these Hebrew Christians, and he's saying, don't neglect this great salvation. There are things that accompany salvation. There is a reward. There's a prize to be won or lost. Don't turn back. Don't drift. Don't doubt. Don't disobey. Don't be deceived. Payday comes one day. The reward, don't neglect your salvation. Turn with me to Second Peter, please, and look at chapter 1. Second Peter and chapter 1. Verse 5, and be, beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Well, have we been adding anything to our saving faith? What shall we add? Virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity. Are we adding anything to our faith? First Peter 2.2 2 is, Newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Am I adding to my faith? Have I accomplished all these things I'm to add in Second Peter 1? Is there no room for improvement? Or am I neglecting this perfect salvation? Look at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. This passage was mentioned in our brother Tom's message on the fruit of the Spirit. Again, we're not arguing whether it's literal or, or plural or singular, fruit or fruits, but the fruit of the Spirit, beginning with verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Have we reached the peak of this fruit? Is there any season of life where the fruit should not ripen? Is it ripening or is it rotting in our lives? The greatest commandment that the Lord Jesus ever gave to his disciples, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. That is the greatest constraint. The love of Christ constraineth us. But the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Am I a happy, joyful Christian? Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Have you lost your joy? Have you lost your song? Are you neglecting this great salvation? There are things that accompany salvation. Am I ever too old for the fruit of the Spirit to ripen in my life? I can answer for myself. There's lots of room for improvement. Peace. Oh, we have peace with God. What about peace with one another? What about the peace, the rest, the quietness of soul that comes to those who trust God? Is the fruit obvious? Is it ripening? Am I ever too old for the fruit of the Spirit to ripen in my life? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Do we run out of patience? 
How quick does it take us to blow our stack? Hmm? Is there room for the fruit to ripen? Gentleness. Goodness. Faith. Meekness. Temperance. Self-control. The fruit of the Spirit. Have we reached the peak? Or is there room for the fruit to ripen? As we examine these key words, I must ask myself, am I neglecting this great salvation? We're going to look at this salvation in its three tenses. It won't take time this morning. Just to prepare our hearts. Salvation is in three steps or stages and has to do with three tenses of time. And those three steps or stages have to do with three of the great doctrines that come under the umbrella of salvation or soteriology. The first one is the doctrine of justification. I have been saved from the penalty of my sins. Therefore, being justified by faith, declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The doctrine of justification. That takes care of my eternal salvation, of which the writer to the Hebrews spoke. My eternal salvation. Having been justified by God, that declaration can never be reversed. God can't reverse that. God has declared us righteous. He has imputed to us the righteousness of his Son. I have been saved from the penalty of my sins. But as we shall see in our next study, salvation is also in the present tense. Am I being saved from the practice of sin? I'm not speaking only of the moral sins that had to do with immorality, the sins of the body, of the flesh. What about the sins of the spirit? David prayed, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Am I guilty of the sin of a wrong spirit? The sin of a wrong spirit? That's a sin. Am I being saved from the practice of sins? That's the doctrine of sanctification. Salvation in that second stage. Then we're looking forward to salvation in its final stage. When our Lord Jesus returns, we shall be like him. Never to be faced with temptation again. Saved from the Not only the practice of sin, but from the possibility of sin. That's the doctrine of glorification. They all come under the umbrella of salvation. Have you been saved from the guilt and penalty of your sins? Have you been born again? If not, God wants to justify you. He wants to declare you righteous. And only God can do that. No one else can do it. Only God can do that. But he wants to justify you if you've never been saved. He wants to save you from the penalty of your sins. And to those of us who have been saved, who have been declared righteous by God, what about step number two? Am I being saved from the practice of sins? What about sanctification? That comes under the umbrella of salvation. That's a part of the great doctrine of soteriology. Am I being saved from the practice of sin? The sins of the spirit, the sin of unforgiveness, 
I spoke in a church in West Virginia on Mother's Day many years ago. At the end of the service, a lady came forward weeping. She said, will you please pray for me? I said, you must have a problem. She said, I do. I said, what do you want me to pray about? She said, I'll get home safely tonight. She said, my mother, who is a Christian, and I, who am a Christian, have not spoken to each other for 18 years. Mother and daughter. It was Mother's Day night. She said, if God lets me get home tonight, I want to call my mother. And say, Mother, I called to tell you I'm sorry for my behavior. I want you to forgive me, and I do love you. Eighteen years living in sin. A saved person claiming eternal security. Eighteen years living in sin. Christians don't speak to one another. They avoid one another, living in sin. Are we neglecting our great salvation? Well, the best is yet to be, but en route to the glorification, we have to be busy about practical sanctification. We'll pursue these. In our next study, let us pray. Father, we thank Thee for Thy holy word, for its simplicity, and yet for its profundity. We thank Thee, Lord, that the message is so clear. There's no way of mistaking it. All we need now, Father, is to heed what we have heard is to put into practice that which has been enjoined upon us as thy children. Thank you, Lord, for all who came this morning. And I thank you, Father, for what thy word has said to me. And if I know my own heart this morning, I want to press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And what I desire for myself, Lord, I desire for these, my brothers and sisters in Christ. And if anyone came today who has never had a genuine salvation born-again experience, Grant, Lord, that that one will trust the Savior before leaving this conference. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.